Rosemary, that was a good uh, segue into the sermon about eyesight and about Israel, God's promise, rest, and the Israelites themselves. Um, and I, I can share that uh, struggle that you have with the, the eyesight. I'm wearing a different pair of glasses today. I figured I'll try this pair. Of Come to find out it makes things look a little double. So I'm like, oh no. <laughs> so we'll get through this. But, um, you know, we do want to pray for Israel. We want to stand with Israel if we are to be God's children. They are His children. So I want to take one minute in silence and pray for Israel. Lord, we, are, we come to you humbly to seek your face, to ask for forgiveness, to pray for others, because we know that you see all. You see into our hearts. Everyone around the world is seen by you. And we know this because of your biblical truth. It's in your word. All you have to do is read it to see that God does see all. And I pray that this morning that, that you would move through this pulpit to deliver a message that would, would open eyes, open hearts, and help people realize that, that you're there for them. And that you do see everything that they're doing. And that they will be held accountable for that. And let that, the fear of the Lord be in them to walk a straight path on a narrow road that leads to a narrow gate. That is my prayer request for you, Father. That you would help those who hear this message. Let the Holy Spirit convict them. And lay them on the road to you. Jesus, in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. The title of the sermon is God Sees All. Uh, this message is about God seeing all. But also a promised rest for those who believe. Now hear that. There is a a promise for those who believe. Amen. How are our Christians of today different from the Israelites that wandered in the wilderness for 40 years in the story of the Exodus? What's funny about this sermon is that when I initially started constructing it, it was all about Hebrews 4.12. And then the Holy Spirit directed me to the Exodus of the Israelites in the 12th chapter of the book of Exodus. And Exodus is one of my favorite books in the Bible. There's so much for us to learn as we walk with God that the Israelites got wrong. Let's not make the same mistake they did. That is what the Bible is for, is for us to learn from. 
The Exodus has three main parts. One is liberation. Israelites were freed from Egypt. The covenant that God gave them, the Ten Commandments. In Tabernacle, God provides blueprints for a template, or temple in His honor. This morning, I want to focus on the liberation of the Israelites and their attitudes toward God while in the wilderness. The liberation of the Israelites from the oppression of the Egyptian Pharaoh is one of the most renowned stories in the Bible. The story of liberation has been inspirational for oppressed people all around the world. Another reason the story is so important is because God is revealing himself to his people and even Egypt's Pharaoh and his people, Pharaoh's people. He wants everyone to know that he is the one and only God and there is no other. He wants us to know that as well. Do we know that? That he is the only God that we should serve. He is who he says he is. And I cannot stress that fact enough that our God is who he says he is. The Bible speaks of that. And we, have, we need to understand who our God is and that he never breaks a promise. Do any of you know that, of a promise that he has broken? Because he hasn't. And he never will. The Exodus is a story where God shows self-revelation. It is through the Exodus that the Israelites learned of God's sovereignty, his majesty, his goodness, his holiness, his grace, and of his mercy. He shows them that he is the Lord, their God, the God of heaven and earth. And at one point, Pharaoh, the Egyptians, and the Israelites all realize that God is who he said he is. Do you remember reading that? God showed everyone that he was the only God. All of Pharaoh's gods didn't compare to the one and only God, the true God. I am who I am, he said. Jesus also refers to himself as I am in John 8, 58, when speaking with the Jews. Let's take a quick look at those verses so we can understand what Jesus is saying and how what he is saying points to him and God being the same. The one who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason you do not hear them because you are not of God. The Jews answered and said to him, Do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and you have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon. On the contrary, I honor my father and you dishonor me. But I'm not seeking my glory. There is one who seeks it and judges Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone follows my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died in the prophets as well. And yet you say, if anyone follows my word, he will never taste of death. You are not greater than our father Abraham, who died for you. The prophets died too. Whom do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, He is our God. And you have not come to know Him, but I know Him. And if I say that I do not know Him, I will be a liar like you. But I do know Him, and I follow His word. Your father Abraham was overjoyed that he would see my day, and he saw it and rejoiced. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Therefore they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and left the temple grounds. Jesus' deity is questioned, but is quickly affirmed. He quickly affirms his superiority over the prophets of Abraham. Over the prophets, prophets and Abraham. Abraham came into being, but when he was born, Jesus was already existing. I am is 
a title of deity. I bring this to light because this shows that God and Jesus are one and the same. Always remember Exodus 3.14. I am who I am. So let's catch up with Moses in Exodus 2.11 and get ourselves in the moment. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Glancing this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what did I, what I did must have become known. Have we done something in our lives that we didn't want anyone to see? If we're to be honest, I'm pretty sure everyone in here has done something in their life that they have probably never told anyone about. And they've hit it in their heart. I think we can all agree that we, we have a hidden story or something that we don't want others to find out about. And does it really affect us if no one finds out? There's only one. There's always one who knows what we did, isn't there? The Bible is quite clear that we will be held accountable for those things. 2 Corinthians 5, 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to what he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Are you in awe of standing in the presence of Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ? I think it's going to be amazing. Yeah. I think it's going to be amazing. It's going to be one of the greatest things that you'll ever get to experience. Does it move you to fear the Lord and impel you on in your service to Him? Does that not make you want to change your ways, knowing that you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ? Then maybe you'll strive just a little bit more, be a little bit more obedient to God. Because in some areas of your life, maybe you're not being as obedient as you should be. Like Rosemary was talking about, that apple. Can a, can a bad apple ruin the whole bushel? Can. You're an influence on somebody's life. Whether it's good or bad. And you're going to be held accountable for that. So does that make you want to change your ways in your Christian walk? It should. If it doesn't glorify God, don't do it. Is the purpose of the relationship with Jesus to persuade people to be reconciled to God? We all need to be reconciled to God. Do you see other people as not being reconciled to God and, and, and talk to them about Jesus and about repentance? So they too can be reconciled to God. Something to think about before we get to the judgment seat of Christ. Hear me on that this morning. It's something to think about before we get to the judgment seat of Christ. Let's go back to Exodus. Let's go back to the story. Moses is now tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. Let's read Exodus 3, verses 1 through 15. I'll give you a second to get your Bibles and so we can read this together. Exodus 3, verse 1 through 15. <clears throat> Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw through the, though the bush was on fire and did not burn up. Could you imagine that sight? Looking at a, a bush that's on fire and it did not be, it was not consumed by the fire. 
So as Moses did, I'm sure most of us would do as well, Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your father, your fathers have sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Here we see God, I am who I am, using Moses, a shepherd, to not just lead a flock of animals, but a, a flock of people to the promised land. All of this was just to set the tone for the story of the people, the Israelites, who will be who the story is all about. How ironic that we're praying for Israel this morning. That we're standing with Israel, God's promised people, His chosen people. We see that God is using Moses to accomplish God's purpose, which is to lead His people through the wilderness and eventually to the promised land. Will they get in? This is to be seen. I know we all know the story. Follow up. If you would, please open your Bible and let's look at Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 to 13. And like I said before, when I started putting this sermon together, the Holy Spirit took me from Hebrews 4, 12 to the story of the Exodus. Stay with me. I'll connect the dots in just a minute. Hebrews 4, 12 to 13. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. For the word of God is alive and active. The same promise, promised to the Israelites who wandered in the wilderness, is promised to us through Christ. Promise rest for us who believe in Christ. By believing and being obedient to the word of God, Christians will inherit the kingdom of God, just as the Israelites inherited the land of Canaan that God promised. The author of Hebrews points out that the rest promised by God is still offered through Christ. The word of God is a double-edged sword. 
It's razor sharp, able to separate what is spiritual truth and what is false. The Word of God is a living document. Jesus likened the Word of God to seed in Matthew 13, the parable of the seed. Seed, like the Bible, is not dead, but living. And it has the ability to bring forth more life abundantly. The Word of God. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. The Word of God knows what we are and what we are not. Remember, God sees all. It can see what is, is at the core of us and what is on the outside, whether it be good or evil. The Word of God will divide the soul from the spirit. The soul and spirit are two distinct essences that can be separated. Water cannot be separated from water, but mud and water mixed together can be separated because they are two different entities. Similarly, although the soul and the spirit are interlinked within the nature of each person, they can be separated and distinguished by the Word of God. This would make for a great conversation in a Bible study. The Word of God. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. God's word penetrates our very spirits. And when the word of God cuts that deep and enters the depths of our hearts, it has the capacity to judge not just our thoughts, but also our very motives, our attitudes, and our intentions. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5 tells us, For he will bring our darkest secrets to light. And will reveal our private motives. He knows your heart. God sees them all. What are the thoughts of the heart in the Bible? Jesus said, don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the thing that comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. And this makes a man unclean. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. The author of Hebrews reminds us everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Our noble ambition that should drive us as a Christian is the knowledge that there is a penetrating, unveiling of the depths of our hearts by the Lord. He sees all. So let's catch up with our Israelites. As they're now at the bottom of Mount Sinai, or also known as Mount Horeb. If you remember, Moses was at the bottom of Mount Horeb when he discovered the burning bush. This is a holy place. It is called the mountain of God in chapter 3, verse 1. So Moses is high up on the mountain with God, but Aaron and the Israelites are disobeying God and making a golden calf. God's anger burned against Moses' people. Remember, he called them your people. He didn't say my people. He said, this are your people, Moses. He saw what they were doing. Aaron, when confronted by Moses, had this to say in verse 22. Do not be angry, my Lord. Aaron answered, you know how prone these people are to evil. You know how prone these people are to evil. I've said all of this to point to their disobedience to God's word. Their actions and attitudes toward God's instructions for them were dismissed. They dismissed God's word for them to be faithful to him and him alone while he was on the mountain with Moses. They dismissed him that quickly. After all they had seen and all he's provided for them, they dismissed him that quick. They needed another God to serve because this man is up on a mountain for 40 days. Where'd he go? Oh, we got to have someone to serve. Let's make a golden calf. What did, what, what, what did we dismiss God for? What have we dismissed God for in our lives and made something else of God? 
God said, "Ye shall serve no other God, but him and him alone. Do you see a parallel between the Israelites and the Christians of today? You see that the, the dots are starting to be connected here. The Christians of today and the Israelites in the, in the wilderness, in the Sinai Desert, they were disobedient to God just as we are. And you're going to see what happens to those people here shortly. And what will happen to us who dismiss God, who are disobedient to God? What will happen to us as well? God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. We say we serve the same God that they serve. And I'm going to cut to the chase. Caleb and Joshua were the only men from their generation who entered the promised land after the time of wandering in the desert. So after 40 years in the desert, only two people made it in. Not even Moses made it into the promised land. He got to look into the promised land, but he never made it in. And you know why? You know why none of them made it into the promised land? And you know why none of us will make it into heaven? Because of disobedience. God expects your obedience. When Jesus said, follow me, that was to follow him and obey him. Moses had lost faith in the Lord to overcome the Israelites' faithlessness. We know this is the truth as we read Numbers 20, verse 12. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me, to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. We cannot... Hear me, Christians, we cannot take matters into our own hands. When we do that, we are not trusting fully in God. We're not trusting in God to fully take, take matters, take care of matters that are made for His hands. Not everything is made for our hands. We have to let go and let God. With God, nothing is impossible. We have to believe that. Our pride gets in the way. We sit here, we think, God, hey God, I got this, I got this, I'll take care of it. I have been proven wrong so many times when I thought that I'll, I'll study for this men's Bible study. I'll do all this hard work. And then when I get ready to leave it, God shuts my mouth. I have nothing to say. This literally happened to me. And it was at that point that I realized that God, I left you out of it. I left the Holy Spirit out of it. And literally, I couldn't talk. I had to have somebody else leave. And I spent all day Saturday and half of Sunday putting a, a great study together. But I couldn't deliver it. Because God literally shut my mouth. And he humbled me. And he said, you left me out of it, Mark. You can't do that. Some things are not made for your hands. These are made for mine. And it was after that that I gave it to him every time. We have to believe that things are made for his hands, not ours. Whatever it says in verse 22 is unbearable to think that anyone would ever say that about me or that I would ever want to say that about anyone about these people are evil. I don't want anyone like Aaron saying that about me or about you. That they would go to someone like Moses and say, well, you know these people, they're evil. We were born into a condemned world. Yes, we were. But Jesus Christ, Christ made it a place where we can live with him. And we don't have to give in to the evil of this world. That we don't have to make a golden calf to worship. There is one God, and one God alone, that we worship. Remember what Eric said, do not be angry, my Lord. You know how prone those people are to evil. Are we just like the Israelites in the story of Exodus? 
Unfortunately, it is still true today, just as it was back in the 13th century. That's B.C., before Christian era. That's a long time ago. But I immediately reflect back to Hebrews 4.12 and how the Word of God has directed my actions, my thoughts, and my life to Jesus Christ. That's what the, the Hebrews 4.12 does to me. It helps me reflect back to Jesus Christ and how He saved my life. And it's not because of anything I have done. Jesus Christ did it all on the cross. I just needed to realize that God came to earth as Christ to save a wretch like me. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Nothing I've done is going to get me to heaven. Jesus Christ did it all on the cross when he said it was finished. All we need to do is rely on Jesus Christ being who he said he was, being who he is. I am. My faith, my faith is in Jesus, and because of that, my name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. Like I said, for he has saved a wretch like me. And you have to believe it. So in closing, Israelites had God with them for 40 years in the desert. He tested them. Oh yeah, he did. He tested them. Here's some facts I want to share with you. There were 603,550 Israeli men aged 20 years and older in that desert during the wandering. Israelite men. If men and women, or women, if men, women and children were to be included in the numbering, it would have been numbered around two and a half to three million people in the Sinai Desert. They say that was for far more than the Sinai Desert could support. Do you see what, see what I'm saying? The desert couldn't support these people. Three million people wandering around in the desert for 40 years in a place where it could not support them. Now you see how important it is to trust God. Putting even that much more importance that they had a God who met their needs. You have to see how God is meeting your needs as well. They only needed to trust Him as we need to trust Him. You don't have to answer this by raising your hand. But do you truly trust God? Do you truly trust Him? Remember, only two from the original generation of people made it into the promised land. Two people out of three million. Here's some, here's some reality checks right here. It's coming. God saw all that they did. It was not right in His eyes. They paid for not being faithful. They experienced God's wrath and that they never got to receive entry into the promised land. Only two made it in. That's not even a few. Jesus said, for many are called, but few were chosen. And he also said that there's a broad road with many on it. Do you reckon the road the Israelites were on was broad? The road they were on led to their destruction. But there were two on a narrow road that led to the promised land. For the road we are on must be narrow if we are to make it to the promised land as well. It comes down to allowing the Word of God to be in the center of your life. To make God your only God. And to obey His Word. The Word that is alive and active. It penetrates. Divides the soul and the spirit, the joint and the marrow. And it judges the thoughts and attitudes of your heart. Know that this morning. Jesus said, follow me. It means to obey and follow. I, I, I can never stress that enough. When he looked at his disciples, his common people, and he looked at them and said, follow me. He meant follow him and him alone. And to obey him. 
and to put your trust in him. Don't you think that God knows better than you? And if he's calling you, shouldn't you trust him? Of course you should. There is a direct correlation of the wandering in the desert and only a, a couple getting into the promised land and the promise that Jesus gives us Christians to let his word be alive and active. Penetrating even to dividing soul and spirit. Hear that. In the joint and the marrow. Dividing the thoughts and the attitudes of your heart. Remember what Jesus also said. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? These are the people that will build their own kingdom. These are the people who thought their good works were going to get them into heaven. You can be the best Christian in the world, and you won't get into heaven if you're not making him first. If you're putting yourself first, you might be who he's talking about. When he declares to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The Israelites practiced lawlessness and didn't get in. Their names were blotted out of the book God had written. Can you imagine that? That your name's written in there, but he blots it out. And there's no getting back in. It's one and done. You're either in or you're out. That's something to think about. As you walk with Christ and fear the Lord, ensure that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That it stays in there. We have verses of promise in our Bibles that promise us eternal life with God. And let me share this truth with you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And whosoever believeth shall not perish, but have everlasting life. A show of hands. Who wants everlasting life? Amen. Do you trust the word of God to deliver you? Amen. It ensures our passage to the promised rest. And if you believe, if you believe, God will see and you will be saved. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I do. I love you and I thank you so much for this day. I pray that for gratitude that you allow me to worship you from this, this pulpit. And the Father, that I pray that our congregation would put you first and that we would be obedient to your word. Lord, I know we'll fall. And we might stray off the path a little bit. But I pray that there's brothers and sisters around us that will, will nurture us and guide us back to your path. And sometimes, even if they got to be strict about it, Lord, I pray that they do it and they do it with love. There's a promise that you promised us. And I pray that we never lose sight of that. Lord, we know that you see all. And Lord, let what we do and what we say glorify you and only you. Help us every day make you the center of our life. And help us be intentional about telling other people about you and what you've done for us and how much you've loved us. That you, that you sent your son here to die for us. There are people in this community, in, in our out, outreaching communities, that don't know you. They know of you, but they don't know you. I pray that we will be intentional about telling these people about you. Lord, let us not die on the inside and become that rotten apple that Rosemary was talking about. I pray that doesn't happen. Help us stay in your word. To be a light and active. Let your word move through us day in and day out. 
and help us build your kingdom, Father. All this I pray in your son's precious name. Amen.